to uh, the congressman's uh, talk today. Um, for those of you who, who got the email, checked it out, um, I included a link to a 26-page report uh, that the congressman released this morning, uh, along with a link to an article in The Hill. Um, and if you uh, haven't had a chance to do that, uh, please check it out. Uh, examine some of the causes, the government-related causes uh, of the housing crisis. And he's going to address that this morning for us. Uh, from his perch as a uh, ranking member on the House Oversight Committee, and then also take any questions that might be on your mind um, about things that are happening uh, with health care and cabinetry, and I'm sure you might get a few of those too. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, I'll stand if uh, if anyone in the back can't, I you can't see me because I can't see you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, and thanks for having me here. Uh, I was commenting as I came in, I'm just going to figure out where I'm going to sit tonight when they rearrange the room for the uh, Heritage Mini Retreat. Hey, Ernest. Uh, where uh, Heritage does so much for, uh, for all of us uh, in the conservative movement, and uh, including giving me the unique opportunity to be a conservative lecturing the French on conservatism uh, rather than the French lecturing us on liberalism. So uh, this truly is the uh, turnabout is fair play. But just as uh, I didn't think the French were particularly smart in there lecturing us on liberalism, I will not presume <coughs> that I can teach the French who are going to the right as we go to the left about conservatism. But I, I would like to uh, reach out to all of you as, as bloggers and as decision uh, movers and shakers uh, and, and give you some food for thought from my vantage at government reform. A little over eight years ago, when I came to Congress, uh, I didn't ask to be on government reform. Tom Davis had been a friend of mine, but he was over at the NRCC, I think, at that time. And so I asked to be on Energy and Commerce, which was his other committee, because he told me that was the committee to be on. And uh, for two years, I toiled in with the Committee on Small Business, plus Foreign Affairs, and uh, <coughs> Judiciary to earn the right to be on Energy and Commerce. And for two years, I was on Energy and Commerce, uh, a committee which I dearly love, but which takes about 20 years to uh, to rise to a level of middle of the road, uh, at least as John Dingle sees it. Uh, and uh, so at the end of about six months, I realized that I had probably made a mistake because uh, I'm a former CEO. I'm uh, far too impatient to, uh, uh, to wait 10 or 15, 20 years for both my golf game to improve and then drop off. Uh, and I don't have patience for golf, period. And uh, so I started conspiring on how to get uh, a leave of absence from Energy and Commerce. And Tom Davis had asked for a waiver for me to join him on government reform and uh, very much wanted my help. And uh, so that's how I got on the committee just four years ago. It's a committee that most people didn't think about as important because we control the House, we control the Senate, and we control the White House. And as a result, it wasn't, it wasn't a good place to be because how dare you spend any time at all making a point out of government's growth, its bureaucracy, its failures. Uh, probably the biggest mistake of the Republican years, uh, either the 12 years in the majority in the House or the, uh, the years, uh, particularly the eight years of President Bush. Government reform is the conservative committee. All the other committees create laws. Uh, 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 even judiciary, the primary defender of the Constitution, spends an awful lot of time creating laws that, that ultimately chip away at liberty. Only government reform, with the exception of running the post office, is the committee <coughs> that's supposed to look at the bureaucracy, and in some cases outside the government bureaucracy, and, and point out uh, the things hanging from the noses of various agencies. Uh, we don't have good, yeah, you know, you think yeah, the visual is perfect, right? We try to do that. I'm going to give an accolade here that you, uh, you won't hear most times, and that is Henry Waxman did it incredibly well during his tenure as a minority ranking member. He did it so well that I think it was a big part of the, of the Democrats taking control because he pointed out from the minority every failure to do something from the majority. And over time, his reports became, uh, at least the ones he points to, became the bellwethers for what the Republicans failed to do. Our committee is trying.
trying to do the same thing. I've recruited a number of members. I continue trying to handpick members who have a healthy disrespect for government. Uh, when, uh, when I went to John Boehner and I said I'd like uh, Jeff Blake to be one of my ranking members, can I get him on my committee? Uh, I think he first said, be careful what you wish for, then he laughed, and then he said, if you want him, he's yours. <clears throat> now, all of you understand that Jeff Blake has been a handful for Republicans. He's pointed out earmarks, and he's pointed them out on a bipartisan basis, and he's embarrassed us. But why not? If you're a conservative, then you understand that the growth of government, the growth of pet projects, the, uh, the contributions leading to certain behavior are exactly what you're supposed to fight against. You swear to uphold and defend the Constitution. You don't swear to expand government, grow intelligently bureaucracies. As a matter of fact, you don't even uh, uh, take a pledge to uh, clean up the air or the water, <coughs> although lately it appears as though we are. And to that end, the report that you, you referenced, uh, which I will be in final form released uh, this afternoon, but all of you have an advanced copy that's 99% finished, tries to play up the truth as we see it about how we, how we got to an economic meltdown that rippled around the world. And uh, I'm going to read you just one line from the 1995 Clinton administration home ownership strategy. Uh, action 44, flexible mortgage underwriting criteria. The Clinton administration should support effort to increase local lender awareness and use of flexible underwriting criteria established by secondary market investors such as uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Many households may qualify, parentheses, for mortgage lending if local lenders are encouraged to more flexibly interpret secondary market purchase requirements. There's a smoking gun. It's a perfect smoking gun. It tells us what Barney Frank, the Clinton administration, and others were doing back in those days. And I think, and this happens to be Action 44, and it's in that uh, their report. It tells us that the seeds of a global meltdown began perhaps well-intentioned with the idea that everybody should have a home. And everybody should have a home even if they can't afford it. So you try to figure out a way to make them afford it. It led to one of the largest Ponzi schemes in the financial market one has ever seen. Because the returns were returns off of earnings that were only based on the insertion of money that created returns. At some point, it was inevitable that you would have to turn off that, that spigot because you couldn't run prices up, no matter how flexible, forever. And when you reach that point and you ran out of gas, then the scheme unwound. Now, Ponzi schemes are something that, uh, that we're seeing in the news. We all understand about Bernie Madoff. Uh, we don't yet understand about Social Security, although some have had the courage to call it Ponzi scheme for a long, long time. Our committee has a responsibility to look at every one of these and see if we can, with help, and Heritage has been very helpful, begin to explain that. This minority report, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I think it's like our ninth minority report, but uh, Henry Waxman, I think, did 30-some. We expect to pass him because the, it's such a rich environment of new agenda. And uh, before I take questions, I just want to uh, touch on two areas, and I'm happy to take your questions uh, on the financial meltdown and how it can be traced back to Freddie and Fannie. And quite frankly, with a 4% current default rate, at uh, uh, Freddie Mac, I would certainly say that uh, we haven't seen the end of a entirely government guarantee that is off books at this point. Uh, I think it's $6 trillion, but, you know, 4% of $6 trillion, I, I hear it's real money, but that the escalation line has gone from 1% to 4% in uh, less than 16 months. So if that line continues to 8 or 10 or 12%, uh, even in Washington standards, we're dealing with another whole equivalent of the TARP, just for the actual losses at Freddie and Fannie. Uh, I think that, uh, that health care is going to be every bit as big an issue for us. And I just want to, uh, as mostly conservatives, or hopefully all conservatives in this room, I want to ask if anyone disagrees that health care 
care in this country costs too much for what you get. We all agree that. We all agree that doctors pr uh, practice defensive medicine. We all agree that we have some of the most expensive uh, prescription costs in America, I mean in the world. We all agree that, uh, that in fact, if you don't have a health care plan and you walk in and you want to pay cash either to your doctor or to your dentist or for a prescription drug, you'll pay more than anybody else who walks in there with any plan. If any, you can jump in here if you disagree with any of these things because it, it could happen. So cash is not king. In fact, cash is the most expensive way to buy health care in America. Uh, not true in Canada, by the way. If you're willing to go to that doctor that's already free and give him a little cash, you'd be amazed at how much you get to the front of the line. <coughs> we, uh, we also agree that, uh, that, in fact, government programs such as uh, uh, Medicare and Medicaid through the states, in fact, drive down what they're willing to pay below what the market pays for other services. In other words, they're cost shifters. Last but not least, I would assume we all agree that the emergency room is the worst place to go for health care. That by definition, if you think you're sick, going to the emergency room and sitting there in a line with the, either before or after the person having a heart attack and the other person uh, who's been brought in from a motorcycle accident is probably not the right way to deliver medicine. So the amazing thing is, as conservatives, when we agree on every bit of this, that we're not more engaged in saying we have solutions. Heritage has been engaged, and I appreciate that, but we're going to have the fight of our life because none of these problems are proposed to be solved by the majority in Congress or the President. In fact, what they intend to do is simply put another layer over these problems. Uh, and that that's what's going to occupy a call you're going to have is physicians are telling every one of you if you attend that that all of these things are true and as conservatives we should know that every one of these things needs to be fixed and hopefully in this debate we at least will have an opportunity to promote those if we don't then my job is to help show that Medicare has the highest level of fraud of any government program that in fact because we pay less than the the fair wage, what happens is we force doctors and health care uh, providers to simply do as many procedures as they can. Since they don't get paid enough on the procedures they need to do, they do more procedures. It's been studied. General Accountability Office has told us this. And under Republicans, we did nothing about it. So uh, I'm here today to tell you that I'm excited to be in the job I'm in. I hope your questions will be uh, on any subject want, but challenge us, because if we're not investigating the failures of the Bush administration, the failures of Denny Hastert and, and his time as Speaker, then we're, we're starting with a clean book and trying to investigate a president who inherited a great many things, some of which go back to, to, uh, to Truman, some go back to Johnson, many, many go back uh, to, uh, uh, to the Reagan era and fixes that were put in but were not sustainable. So, if you're willing to ask questions and be cynical about Republicans and Democrats alike, then I'd love to have you all uh, help me today. And, uh, and by the way, I take as many interns as I can get. So uh, we're, uh, we've are we got plenty of room over at Ford for people who want to work for us. And with that, I'd love to take your questions on any subject. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. You were saying the You were so quick with your hand. I'm impressed. <laughs> and your name? My name's Aaron. I'm with the Republican Jewish Coalition. Um, you were saying that Waxman did a good uh, a good job as the ranking minority member in that. He grew the stature of the committee, even from the minority. How would you say, what kind of job rating would you give him now that he's the ranking majority member, or the chairman? Uh, there's so many Yiddish words I can't use. <laughs> <laughs>
to death, and uh, in health care, both of which his solutions won't work. So that's where I think he has a problem. He's not somebody who can embrace uh, differing opinions within his own party, and I'll give you the briefest one. Uh, Nick Rahal is from West Virginia, and he heads the Resources Committee. Anyone who cared about that energy bill would have found a way to either neutralize or embrace whatever Nick Rahal needed to be on that bill. First of all, because that gives you two senators that could be on that bill. And second of all, because if, it's, if, if somehow it can be shown in the long run as good for the state that gives us coal, it can be shown as good for America. Didn't reach out to him, just rolled it. And was shocked when, when Ray Hall said, I, I represent my state, I can't vote for this. It's the end of, of jobs in West Virginia. So I think I'd give him a, a C minus, maybe less. Uh, he did a good job of, of beating Vigil up, and he, uh, he did a good job of giving him the presence of looking like he didn't throw him aside, but not enough uh, staff to do anything. Uh, but, you know, the one thing I know about Henry is he's not a very sharing guy. Uh, it just, it's not in his DNA. If it was worth doing, it was done at full committee. And, uh, and that's, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes, is that uh, uh, working with Ed Towns, Ed Towns doesn't really want to do a lot at full committee, and he's perfectly happy to give, within reason, his ranking, or his, his chairman, uh, the ability to do things at subcommittee, which means that we will grow the committee even more. It's not always the way I want to, but the committee will be healthier. So uh, I, I miss Henry because uh, every time I go to uh, a hearing and I sit in the ranking member seat, I look at the divots where he pounded the gavel to try to silence me. <laughs> And uh, I don't know why they haven't repaired it. You'd think it's the only place they ought to. It at least fixes these incredible. He, he never hit the uh, the pistol. He just uh, he just pounded on the dais. Yeah. When you travel around, the, or at least when I travel around the country, and I talk to people. There's I don't get out much anymore. <laughs> San Diego is a great place to get out. Yes, it is. Um, you hear this constant theme that <coughs> Republicans failed to stop the growth of government, failed to rein it in. And a lot of people don't believe that putting us back in charge, putting Republicans back in the majority, is going to make any difference to the growth of government. There's a real discontent out there. And so Republican candidates, particularly challengers, who are trying to make the point that they're, they're going to be different, uh, are having trouble. And my question is, from your perspective of, as you know, overseeing some of the worst aspects of this. What kinds of positions and legislation and approaches would you recommend <coughs> that grassroots conservatives take to show that they're going to be different and that they're a majority that they help create will be different from the last one? Well, I mean, the first first of all, uh, how many Catholics are in the room? Uh, Orthodox counts, too. OK, so 20%, one that's on the cusp. OK. Uh, the, <laughs> You know, the, the guy that does this is like, okay. Uh, you don't get redemption without confession. Uh, I think Republicans have to, they have to take every opportunity to throw things we did wrong under the bus. Uh, Mike Oxley was on the phone with me today, angry as hell, yelling about this report. And there was a technical flaw. We looked at it, we're correcting it. And there was a, uh, a we quoted one source, if we had we quoted the other source, we'd have gotten it more right. So that will be taken care of in the final version. On the other hand, he was mad in hell that we didn't recognize that he tried to reign in the GSEs. Well, that report, you know, deals with the reality. He may have tried, but he failed. He failed when we controlled the House, the Senate, uh, and the White House. He failed to scream bloody murder on television that this apocalyptic event was inevitable if we continue to allow full faith and credit of the United States government, or virtual full faith and credit, to be pledged behind risky investments that, uh, that people were doing and flipping them to Freddie and Fannie. And the collapse of everybody else paled, really, in comparison. I mean, there's, there's $6 trillion in the GSEs. We have not bailed out as much as they actually are still holding. Uh, so, you know, Oxley's going to be mad at me. Because even after we carefully protect the accuracy of our report, it still isn't going to look good for the fact that in 2004, they authored a bill 
the bill got stripped of one of the key provisions, which was that it would limit the size of these GSEs. They really should be, uh, if they're going to exist at all, sort of 1 24th of the size of the country, 1 12th for each of the two, so that they independently and differently work, so that there would be some check and balance. And by the way, he should have demanded that the bill that bears his name, Sarbanes-Oxley, <coughs> ruthlessly apply to these people from day one. That, that, that in fact, uh, the light had to shed on these organizations uh, and Franklin Reigns and all the corruption that was going on behind closed doors in, uh, in their reporting sooner. Now, I probably will not say that in another venue because Mike Oxley, how many of you know Mike Oxley other than the word Sarbanes-Oxley? Okay, well, you don't cow. Come on. <laughs> uh, there's always one right. shill that you bring in. To this. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact is, he's not famous. He's successful, he's bright, he's not famous. But George W. Bush touted again and again and again, right up until 08, the highest level of home ownership in history. He sat there with this Ponzi scheme going on and a home affordability going down precipitously while the price went up so that the multiples of your earnings that you were paying for a house were unsustainable, and he continued to say things about it. If we're not willing to say that, if you're not willing to say as bloggers, Bush didn't get it, he was still talking about home ownership rather than home affordability, then you're absolutely right. We don't deserve our credibility back. We've got to learn from our mistakes. We made some. Uh, you know, but a little bit like Winston Churchill, you will be out for two reasons. One is you'll be out of favor. The other is they won't need you. Now, we're out of favor right now, and they, they don't yet know they need us. We may still be out of favor, but before long, they're going to really need us. They're going to need people that believe that personal liberty comes from holding down the size of government, and they're definitely going to believe that the economy did not spring back for a perfectly understandable reason. And I don't want to lecture, so tell me the reason the economy is not springing back today. How about $2 trillion went into supporting government and virtually zero went into supporting the private sector? The stimulus package does government things. It bails out government. The TARP bailed out government-backed loans. Where was there a investment tax credit the way Reagan had it in the 80s? Where was there some incentive for you in the private sector to get off your dump, take whatever money you have under your mattress, and invest it in what you think the future is. It wasn't there. Everybody called Washington to say, how do I get here? How do I get the money? Where's the stimulus money? In my head, I think I have a nickel for every time that uh, I got a call asking, how do I get in on the stimulus money? And it's this big bag of nickels. The fact is, everybody saw it as come to Washington for money. That's why it's going to fail. And they're going to need us because they're going to realize that empowering the private sector, motivating the private sector, motivating the entrepreneur, motivating the college graduate who can't get a job to go invent a job is what Republicans do. It's what the conservative principles do. It is not what the liberal agenda of more government jobs does. And this summer you're going to have a lot of kids in little brown uniforms paid for out of stimulus package and every park handing out little baggies because all the federal parks have this huge amount of money to hire summer help. And they're there in huge numbers. But that's going to get old, and the economy is going to be lethargic until we cut down the size of government uh, and empower, or, or at least empower the private sector to grow the economy enough to get past what we've done to government. Yes, sir. Yes, I, I was going to ask you uh, something, something else the uh, Oversight Committee is dealing with is the uh, issue of Gerald Walton and also the Park Inspector General Neil Borowski. Well, that's the, um, that's the abuse part of the waste, fraud, and abuse. Right. Uh, firing an IG for doing his job just because uh, the person he's going after is a friend of the president uh, is the kind of abuse that uh, that we live for. Uh, and we live for it not because it happens to be the president's friend, uh, not because this kind of a, a firing and then the arrogance to say, well, we're, we're not actually terminating him for 30 days now that we noticed in the law that although we fired him, he has 30 days, quote, notice to Congress. Uh, we're going to continue to push that because the administration may succeed with him. I suspect they will. And, you know, he's 70 some years old. He's wealthy. He'll, uh, he'll, his voice will still be heard after he leaves office for what he's done and done right. But the administration is going to have to deal with arrogantly ignoring the intent of 
Congress. The intent of Congress is we have a problem with the IG. Here's our problem. You have 30 days uh, consultation before we can terminate him. Instead, they terminated him and began making up, repeatedly making up different reasons. And we can give you the, the sequence of different reasons. And I don't think they're done. This, this scandal looks worse than the absolutely terrible, dumb, needless scandal of the firing of the U.S. attorneys. When the U.S. attorneys were fired, they were Republican appointees, fired at will in most cases so they could get people they liked in to be U.S. attorneys before and, and have that on their resume before the end of the administration. But they made up so many different reasons for different U.S. attorneys that by the time it was over, nobody really knew who was fired for what reason. In this case, it's a Republican uh, appointee who, in fact, went after a prominent Democrat for real wrongdoing, and now they're saying, quote, he isn't doing his job, and they want to get rid of him. They want to make that story go away. Is, it, is, is there a pattern in that, though, and trying to watch dogs? Because we've seen this with Neil Barofsky. They're trying to deny current documents to him and trying to put him under the supervision of Wagner. There are only two ways an administration can look at their IGs. They can look at their IGs as their neutral observers, their equivalent of what, what my job is, or they can look at them as the enemy, constantly embarrassing the administration by uncovering failures of their own bureaucracy. It appears very early on as though this administration is going to go with the latter. And that is a terrible mistake. You should embrace, every administration should embrace every IG's findings, uh, whenever possible, hope that they have true tales to the previous administration, uh, but embrace them and move on. Uh, President Bush at the end was chastised for how many open investigations had not been acted on uh, by IGs and General Accountability Office, but in fact, they were in the mid-90s of ones they'd acted on, so when you really looked at how many months were, were there, they were pretty current, and I think that's the good thing in the Bush administration. And there isn't a lot of good in the Bush administration. The Bush administration grew government at all levels. The Bush administration spent money uh, on, uh, on both butter and bullets. Uh, and the butter was an excuse because they needed the money from the bullets. That is, that is exactly what uh, weak, weak countries and weak governments do, is they don't make their people make sacrifices. And even FDR told his people, there had, our people that, that there had to be sacrifices during World War II. Well, the Germans didn't know that the war was going badly until they literally couldn't be given anything. Uh, that's one of our problems, is we should have made sacrifices in 2001, 2002, so that we would really know that there's a cost to shifting money to, uh, to the war and to defense. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question on a social issue. What's your name? Uh, Anthony Kane. I'm with Accuracy Media. Um, there is an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, I get the need for a unified front on you know, fighting nationalized health care, grassroots organization, but... I, I just finished telling you I agree with all of, right. the, uh, uh, all of the problems. Right, right. There's no unified front. There, that's one of our problems, is getting right. people to agree that the problem is, is not what we're arguing about. We're arguing over a different solution. Right. So how do you propose we go about finding you know, this massive obstacles, color trumping all else I see by, you know, the recent election, and this whole rhetoric about, you know, Republicans don't help the Hispanics, the African Americans, where, you know, oh, we're socially conservative, it's just that the Republican Party doesn't help us, and they're neglecting us. How do you propose we go about fighting that myth, that giant elephant? Well, sometimes introducing the elephant in the room is, is a good way. Uh, the problem is we don't have very many of those elephants that got in the room. We really do. Uh, we do have a, a, a void of African Americans, Jewish uh, Republicans, uh, Hispanics, except for Cubans. Uh, uh, we we trail slightly in women, uh, particularly unmarried or younger women. Uh, so instead of introducing the elephants and saying here they are in the room, we really have them. Why don't we just be honest and say? We're not for social programs that, uh, that in fact hand out. And if you believe, if you're a Hispanic American or an Asian American and you believe those social programs are critical, then stay with the Democratic Party. If you believe that empowering opportunity 
making those opportunities to those who will do the right thing. Uh, uh, Bill Cosby is somebody who I just think people don't, they, they underestimate how often he's been talking like a Republican his whole life. He has been a champion for telling the black community that they need to fix their problems, that Republicans can, and Democrats can, can eliminate all these real obstacles, but they can't cure HIV AIDS. They can't clear, cure uh, people who don't work. They can't deal with uh, families who are, whose children are abandoned by uh, one, of, one or more of their parents. They can't deal with people who commit crimes and thus are in prison. Only that community can do it. And so, you know, as a, as a conservative and a Republican, I, I think that we're better off saying, look, we don't have a lot of poor people. The poor people we have are poor people of faith, and poor people who have faith in opportunity and are willing to believe in the party that offers opportunity, even if they may not achieve it, even if their parents didn't achieve it, and even if they're not sure their children are going to achieve it. And then say, but we believe in this strongly enough that we will break apart, like Teddy Roosevelt did, the trust, the rich, the powerful, who in fact will keep you from succeeding. And by the way, we'll break apart the large, powerful government who often is willing to give you a small amount of money, but not let you make a large amount of money. I think if you if you try to be inspirational and, and genuine, it comes through. I think if you try to just bring in a token X, Y, or Z and pretend that we've got our elephants too, then pe people see through it. The truth is the poor and those who are afraid are not likely to go with us. The bold and, uh, and those who see opportunity are likely to go with us, and we have to deal with the other part. When I mentioned uh, health care, we don't have catastrophic health care protection. We don't have a guarantee in our society that if you become ill, that you know you will get good care if you cannot care for yourself. We have these safety nets. We have the, all this stuff, but people don't believe it. How many of you, have, how many of you do not have a health care plan of any sort? How many of you have, do have, all have health care? How many of you are afraid of losing your health care if something happens? Okay. And you, except for one lady who's young but not that young, most of you are very young. Well, uh, you're young, you're just not that young. But most of you are very young. I didn't come in here to be insulted. Ouch! <laughs>
make last year's version, it may not be that easy to make it generic because the transfer of that technology is not required. In other words, it's a patent plus a trade secret. Uh, the, the worst model for uh, prescription drugs is Canada. You can't drive down the price by telling patent holders you're just going to avoid their patent if they don't sell at a certain price. The best example, quite frankly, would be uh, why is it the federal government doesn't simply say, we will use only generics if generics are safe, effective, and reasonably able to treat? The fact is, if the federal government just simply became the largest buyer of generic medicines, medicines that cost dramatically less, uh, that shift towards saying, you know, we're not, we're not going to, uh, to buy, you know, I can't think of a, a, a drug to name because they, you know, offend Glaxo or Pfizer or somebody. But whatever the blockbuster drug is, last week's drug probably does a good enough job. That's one of the best ways to drive down the price of, the, of, uh, of patent medicine is say, look, we'll pay more, but we're only going to pay so much more. Uh, the uh, reimportation from Canada, which was popular seven or eight years ago, would be the dumbest one. Even if, if, if California reimported, we would we would actually reimport more drugs than uh, than Canada uses. Uh, it's a it's a tough issue. What I'm going to say right now is, it's going to be tougher when we nationalize healthcare, because there's nothing in the president's proposal or in Waxman's proposal that gets to the core problem, which is America needs to be part of self-rationing. And, and if you listen to, how many of you have listened to Newt and some of his work on this? Okay. What, the most important thing that we don't do and that no, almost no health care plan does is we don't make you a participant in the decision. We don't say we'll pay 90% of your generic, but only uh, X percent or only the same amount of dollars if you want the other drug that costs more. We don't make you part of your self-rationing. Most health care plans don't do it. The federal government doesn't do it. And that's inherently a, uh, a problem. We've got to find ways that, that make you uh, part of it or the government will ration like uh, I'm sure our French friends would tell you that there's a, there's a million ways to ration socialized health care, including delay and availability. And that's not very American, in my opinion. Yes, sir. Last question. There's a fine line. I always love the guy in the back, in the back with his arms crossed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my seat to the elderly. <laughs> 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 I just want you to know, you heard it here last. <laughs> What's your proposing? I would say there's a fine line, but there's really no line.
you, in fact, empower people to, if they can afford to, to make the decision. And by the way, if they can't afford to, then how much will government pay? And if we, if we do socialized medicine, as I think we will, even though it'll be a two-step, but we'll get there at the rate we're going, you're going to still have, uh, eventually, the government saying this is all we can afford. Right now, the government doesn't say this is all we can afford with anything, but that's because we're willing to deficit spend at an alarming rate. So I agree with you that it's pretty easy to say it's still rationing, but means testing is is not rationing because you assume you're not means testing a participant. You're means, test, means testing the drugs, the treatment. You're coming between the doctor and saying this is what we'll pay for, rather than telling the patient to wait. You're telling the doctor this is all the cover, so this is all you can prescribe. If we change the tort law, and I'll let you be the devil's advocate happily because I'm going to have plenty of them in the weeks to come. If we change the uh, uh, the uh, Hippocratic oath and said, do no harm and spend more, no more than you think you need to, uh, we could change a lot of things. We're not doing that. Uh, and certainly the same thing. If we, if we held the standard for lawsuits on a doctor to be, did he do what was medically reasonable, not did he do everything that was medically possible, and we got rid of the huge amount of defensive medicine, then we'd probably be having less of an argument over this because the reason the doctor prescribes that newest, greatest uh, pharmaceutical advancement is because he doesn't want to be said that he didn't use the best he could find. So uh, I'm not defending or chastising Glaxo or Pfizer or any of the other healthcare companies. Their job is to sell the, the most drugs they can at the highest price. Would you that, want to take the best you could find? rather than something that should probably quite possibly be good enough. I'll take it from my mother. My mother wants to know all, all that can all that she needs to know to make an informed decision. And then she wants the option to buy what she wants to buy. That's the way my mom describes healthcare. She's a retired nurse. If people understood the real cost and they felt that cost personally, then in many cases they would say, I'll take the two-a-day uh, drug, not the one-a-day drug. Now, we're not saying that anyone should take a, uh, uh, a drug that's not going to cure them. No one should take, a, uh, uh, take penicillin just because it's cheap if it's not going to kill the bug and, and make them well. But most, it, it, here's the way to look at it, in my opinion. Heart disease has not been figured out. My father died of, of a stroke, but had coronary heart disease for years. He had a triple bypass. He had a, two other procedures that weren't stents then. And uh, so I looked into it. Now, doctors for a generation before that did open heart surgery before they did bypasses. Do you, anyone know what they did? This is a great one for uh, 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 Charles Bustani. You know what their first open heart surgery was? They opened up your chest, they split you apart, they brought you to near death, and then they poured talc uh, on all your your, uh, your vessels and closed you back up. And the talcum was, a, was an irritant and was believed to, to spawn additional growth and thus help lower your blood pressure. Now, years later, they kind of snicker at it because it wasn't worth the risk of opening somebody's chest up and, and putting them out. Uh, they then went to bypass surgery, which they now find that in many cases, uh, is, is net zero value in, in five and ten year studies. They then went to uncoated stents. They now find in five or ten year studies that they're not all that good. So when you really look at informed consent, yes, there's somebody who wants to pay for the very best, but when we're looking at health care, the fact is that what worked, if it worked, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, that's off patent is by definition the most proven because the studies are in. You know what the side effects are, you know what the long-term side effects are, and they probably had a be have a better feel for what it will do or not do for you. So do you want the doctor to prescribe you the newest, greatest? Maybe, but in many cases, you, you would be better off economically and predictability uh, with those. And I want doctors to be able to make that decision without fear of a lawsuit. And we're not going to get any of that, by the way. Just, just so you understand, I serve, still serve on judiciary. I know they're going to give me the hook. Uh, 